Hey there guys, welcome back to another video with me, Ben Rogachan, aka The Seattle Data Guy. If you've been watching this channel for a while, you'll notice that, well, my background has changed. Uh, we'll make it uh, nice and spiffy later, but I recently just bought a house, so I've been dealing with that. And we've obviously had to move studios. That being said, today I wanted to talk about data modeling and specifically around, you know, the actual way we end up storing data, right? Like how do we actually put it in tables and why do we do it? Really what I wanted to focus on this video is talk about some of the challenges we face when data modeling. So generally when people talk about data modeling, um, the traditional way we often start is to focus on something like the snowflake or star schema. If you haven't seen it, here's like a few examples. And you'll notice uh, they often kind of follow the exact same shape where it's like one table in the middle, maybe four or five tables on the outside and it kind of looks like a star, generally with like sales or orders in the center. Now the problem with this data model is it's similar to the way that when you're doing data science projects, you often work on like the Titanic or Iris data sets. These data sets are very clean and always work really well, right? Like it, these are just data sets that always work. And if you've worked any amount of time in the data science world, you know very much so that that is just not the way the world works. Your data is not clean, your data is messy, even if it's been modeled nicely, but most of the time, that's not the case. So before going into like the nitty, nitty gritty of like an example, what I really wanna do is talk about why it's challenging with real life examples of what makes data modeling challenging at various companies. So let's dive into it. First, the probably maybe most obvious is that not everyone is having to data model the same way. For a very long time, I think a lot of people were forced to essentially data model in a very similar fashion where you often took a star schema, snowflake schema. Yes, there was some Kimball and Imbel, Kimball and Imbel. Yes, there was some Kimball and Inman um, arguments that went back and forth in terms of how you should data model. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a bit of a conflated topic, really. Um, I, I think I'll tell you what it's not, right? So I think all too often what we're trying to do is, um, you know, say that data modeling is like, Kimball or Inman or these kinds of things, right? I think that that's, it's certainly a good start. Um, but I can't say that that's right now. I think we're at an interesting point in our industry where we're conflating tactics, uh, with practices. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, um, and, and sort of missing the bigger picture. Now with the cloud and the various ways that people end up uh, storing data, whether that's you know completely separating storage and compute using systems that only allow you to basically insert and not really update, all of these things impact how we data model. For example, when I worked at Facebook, most of us might have heard the term slowly changing dimensions and I've used a few pictures, you can use some of these. The goal of these uh, slowly changing dimensions is to capture information about change. That way you can answer certain business questions, which we'll get to in a second of why business questions are important, but that way you can answer certain business questions. You know, if you only track the current state of let's say employees, you can't tell how often people are promoted. And at Facebook, because of the system we were using, uh, it was similar to HDFS, we really couldn't run updates. And it was just made more sense for us to insert new data. So this led to the data model where most of the time we would just have a brand new set of data every day you'd have a different essentially date partition for every day. So you kind of have this image where again, each kind of thing, you can almost think of it as a file, but it's all one table, right? All separated by the date. Now, this means when you actually write a query, I'm gonna put it up here, you have to both join on the ID as well as the date. Or another very common uh, approach to how we would query this data is we would use a macro that would essentially select the largest date uh, for that partition. And that's essentially what it would pick. So instead of writing like select max from this table, you just put in the state partition and it did it for you. But yeah, we use the term dim in fact, and some people use DNF, whichever one you prefer all the time, but they really weren't the dims and facts that you would be accustomed to. And in fact, in terms of data modeling, I'd say there was, wasn't that much in terms of other companies that I've worked at involved for many, many reasons. One of the reasons is this next problem that you will face at every company is integration. Now at Facebook, integration was easy because most of the systems uh, joined very easily together because they were developed to, to uh, talk together at the application level, so it worked really well. In fact, we had the opposite problem where we were constantly having to remove IDs so people wouldn't be confused later down the line if there were multiple IDs that could kind of do the same thing. So for us, we had to remove IDs. 
Now, a much more common reality is, let's say you have this common model, whatever. You've got the center, it's got orders, you've got dimensions like customer, um, you know, product and so forth. The problem is this pretty picture almost makes you assume that, oh, customer must probably just come from one source, right? Maybe same thing with product, but that's not at all how any of this works. <laughs> I wish it were. But generally for a lot of companies, you have multiple systems. Often maybe you've got like a uh, European uh, arm of your company. Maybe you've got a, um, a US one, maybe Asia. They may or may not talk to each other. You might be using different ERPs for all of them. And yet when you want to do reporting, you want to report on all of it. And maybe you even have multiple instances of the same customer. And again, you're going to want to conjoin that over um, and make sure that you're looking at the same customer across UK, Europe, et cetera, and you don't have multiple um, instances. So this causes a major issue with integration. And to be clear, that's not even including when you have two different systems that you want to talk to each other and you have to deal with that issue. The problem is you often, again, have multiple systems that you now want to join the data uh, together of into maybe one customer table. In some cases, maybe you want to union it together. In other cases, maybe you want to actually literally join it together so it's one row. So, you know, a customer from system A, B, and C come together and become one customer. But how? You know, this, this becomes the challenge. And then also, which ID is then the master ID? You have a few options here, of course. Um, one of the options is you just pick a master system, like let's say Salesforce, um, that then populates every other system, either automatically or manually. And that way it auto populates and you don't have to deal with um, that whole problem later on as the data engineer. This is why a lot of people reference like process as part of the way that you have to prove, as part of the way you improve your data strategy. You need to have processes in place to make data modeling easy. Because the other option is to create systems that then centralize and create a single ID that then track essentially this customer uh, throughout the process. Both have pros and cons, um, right? The creating a central ID can be very complicated. Uh, if you don't create that central ID based off of some way of being able to reverse engineer it, uh, there is some risk that you could lose that ID throughout the process, which then could force you to backfill all of your data at some point in the future. And the other way, which is you know manually or automatically getting people to integrate it at the application level, requires a lot of coordination. It requires a lot of time and budget, um, often requires an expensive solution like Soligo or some other um, iPaaS type solution to integrate all this data um, across your various solutions. So integration is a major problem. And this is a little more at the granular level. So I think a lot of people are interested in the granular side of things. Because again, we can cover the high level data model, but really that's kind of not easy. It's very challenging, but once you get into the nitty gritty, that's where all the problems really start. And that gets me to the last point that I really wanted to make here. It's that I think some people assume that data modeling is a quick thing that you do, right? Maybe it's because, you know, in interviews, we give you an hour to answer how to develop a data model or 30 minutes. Like I, I remember getting asked to do a data model on how to design um, a data warehouse for basically a college. Then you want to track like grades and which classes people went to and uh, who, which teachers had like the highest satisfaction. And you know, that's pretty easy to do. These are toy problems that are very arguably simple to come up with an idea pretty quickly of how you could do this. But when you look at the traditional method of data modeling, especially enterprise data warehouses, You'll notice that it often took months, if not sometimes a year or more to really get to a point where you felt comfortable with your data model. The point and the reason we use a lot of these toy examples is just to explain the different components. The hard part of doing data modeling is getting all the requirements that from the business and figuring out what questions they want to answer, what questions they can want to answer in the future and creating a model that can then adjust easily and quickly to these requests. And when we did interviews at Facebook for uh, data modeling, we would want you to ask questions. We would want you to figure out what the requirements were there in the interview, because there was no way you could figure out the data model uh, for what we were asking. Uh, at the point, I think I got asked something about an airplane um, system in terms of like airplanes coming in, coming out and so on. It was either that or uh, possibly it was like an Uber app, but I don't remember which one. The point is we created it in such a way where you have to ask questions. The hard thing I think with creating maybe even a video, and I'm, I'm gonna get a few hopefully um, other experts onto this uh, whole concept here. But the problem with making a video on the subject is that it's not just about 
how to data model in certain in sense of like, oh, here's a box and here are the other boxes. It's also, what is the process of actually going from, you know, an idea and getting all the source systems together, gathering requirements and going through that whole flow and actually creating a model that then supports that and can adjust easily. That is the actual hard part. And, and is the part that you will learn the most at. This is why I think with data modeling, the best way to learn it is to go work for a company where you have the opportunity to do it or, or where you can see someone else's data model. Honestly, at a lot of larger big tech companies, sometimes the data model you're putting into place won't be anywhere close to some of these traditional um, data models. And nowadays people are often pushing for these other concepts. You know, I've heard activity schema, uh, one big table, and there's so many ideas floating around that I think it's really hard to understand why people make decisions and which ones they're picking. And so many people are so adamant that they have the right idea and how they should model that I think it can be a little bit hard. So I think the biggest thing that anyone can do, and I've always told people this, right? And I've always supported this is like, yes, read something like Kimball, and that's a great start. Take some time to pr practice modeling but the biggest thing that I think is important is you asking yourself, why am I making these decisions in terms of modeling my data the way that I am? But through time that's been lost. I think we're, we're so focused on the implementation details and the physical, and we'll get into this in a bit too, but you know, there's conceptual, logical, physical modeling and so forth. And we would really, I think starting and ending with the physical modeling and ignoring the, the higher level stuff, which I think is actually the more important stuff to talk about and, and do, but yeah, so. Yeah. Oftentimes when I am forced to design some sort of data model, those are the times that you really start to figure out, okay, why am I actually, you know, turning this into dimension? Do we actually need a slowly changing dimension here? Or am I just putting it there because that's something that I read in a book once. And all of that just comes through practice and working with people that are arguably more experienced than you. And yes, obviously I hope I can make a video where we talk about this more without actually, I think going through the stress and all of the um, deep thinking that is required to model data well, I feel like it's always hard to convey everything that goes into uh, a good data model. That being said, I am trying to convince uh, Zach Wilson and maybe if we're lucky, Joe Reese, uh, to jump onto a live where we can talk about data modeling because I really wanna get a ton of people's uh, expertise on the matter because there's just so many different ways people have uh, model data out there. Uh, again, depending on whether you work for a big uh, enterprise versus working for big tech, you're gonna see all sorts of ways that people set up their data. With it guys, I just wanna say thanks so much for watching this video. I really appreciate it. Hopefully I will set up uh, my studio here in the next few weeks, but if not, you'll keep seeing this very white background. Thanks so much for everyone joining this video and I will see you in the next one. Thanks and goodbye.